some of the content you're about to see is disturbing. Asian Americans becoming targets of discrimination. The whole neighborhood is under siege. According to the NYPD, hate crimes against Asian Americans in New York City are up 800%. A gentleman approached me and started yelling racial slurs. This is you, you dirty Chinese. And he just kept saying that over and over again. I remember growing up and having people tease me for my mom's Asian eyes, for my Asian eyes. I got into college and people calling me, you know, uh, chicken chow mein. Culture plays a huge role in untangling a lot of this and making sure that we don't confirm a lot of these stereotypes going forward. What happens right now and over the course of the coming months will send a message for generations to come as to whether we matter. Stop Asian hate! Stop Asian people! Just now, we're starting to see more Asian Americans in TV shows, in movies, but on a very peripheral basis. It wasn't until I got into the industry that I realized how Asian I was. And I needed to fit into this box of these particular characters, tropes, or stereotypes that only I should and could play. Too many Asian Americans have been waking up each morning this past year genuinely fearing for their safety. Nearly 6,600 incidences of anti-AAPI attacks in all 50 states have been reported over the last year. That is why Congress responded with the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Michelle Alyssa Goh died on Saturday morning after she was pushed in front of a subway train. He was advocating the sale of shirts that said that coronavirus was a result of China, which obviously has serious anti-Asian overtones. One in three Asian American parents said their child experienced a hate incident at school. We must never forget that AAPI history is also American history. It is a great honor to be invited to the White House today to discuss the important issues of anti-Asian hate crime. We are Asian Americans. We're going to stay. Our culture matters. I, I think it's so important, especially right now. We put hands together for us again and see you happy that my life And I know we are here today to talk about Asian hate, the racism virus specials we put together for NBC News Now, and some very serious topics, but I have to say, it is so wonderful to look across this room and see all your beautiful faces. AAJ is very special to me. This is where I got my start in this career 22 years ago exactly. So thank you very, very much for being here. As I mentioned, it's been you know a very difficult two years, particularly for this Asian American community. And not just dealing with COVID-19, but also the ramifications of being stigmatized unfairly for this disease that has affected our entire country. Uh, I should probably introduce myself. Guys, I'm Vicki Nguyen. I'm uh, the senior consumer investigative reporter at NBC News. I'm also a News Now anchor, and I am a product of AAJA, the student projects, the mentorships, all of it. So I'm really, really excited to get to know all of you over the course of the next few days. Um, but we're gonna dive right into this. We're gonna look at the journalistic aspects of covering this in our own communities. We're gonna look at the personal aspects of what this was for our families, how we rose to meet the occasion, and we're gonna answer some really important questions with this incredible panel. Before we get to all of that, I really am excited to introduce you to someone who is very special at NBC Universal. He is the chief diversity officer for us, an incredible advocate, but also a personal inspiration. Please welcome to the stage, Craig Robinson. Thank you so much. I'm going to kind of, it's only like three minutes. I'm going to wander back and forth so I don't block any one person completely. Thank you so much. Uh, Vicki, you are an inspiration to me and to so many of us, and it's inspiring to see this room completely full like this. And while we are talking about a topic that is very serious, um, I do also want to take joy in the 1,600 people that are here at the event, a record, I think, in the past 15 years, and also a bit of levity in that I had my 1976 high school um, prom in this room. <laughs> yes, it is true. And as I said to my colleague, I think the disco balls are vintage. So, uh, but it, it, it really is a bit of a homecoming because I'm also a product of Los Angeles. My mother, my 89-year-old mother, was born in Chinatown and was raised in Chinatown and grew up in the area that used to be China City. 
China City was built in 1938, as many as you know, burned, uh, was, uh, sadly, to the ground in 1949, and is now the site of the Philippe uh, French Dip Sandwich um, parking lot. Part of it, but, it's a, but it's a part of this city's history that lives on, and my, and my Chinese-American cousin, Carrie Kwan Large, who was a Seattle Times, um, a Seattle Times, uh, uh, I, I, you threw me off because I, I, I saw you were raising the roof for, for Carrie, I'm going to have to tell her. She uh, retired recently from the Seattle Times where she had a, about a 30 year career, um, Asian American and Caucasian, and she just finished interviewing my mother for a book. Uh, we have a number of pictures of a gift shop that we owned, that my family owned in China City. And when I sent something out about that to our employees, I got so many notes back with similar stories, similar immigration stories. She also did piece work. I used to help her glue in the little uh, tickets that she would pull off so she would be paid by the piece. That's why it's called piece work. And, and she would sew yokes onto, onto um, jackets. So. It's hard for anyone, I would hope, to look at these stories and to know what's going on in this country and not to be touched and um, terrified and hopefully horrified by what they're seeing. But certainly us as Asian Americans feel this in a very visceral way. And one of the things that's ironic to me is that we're talking about this being a timely topic. It was a timely topic when my mother was a little girl walking in Chinatown when she was seven years old in 1940 and felt like an outsider and felt unsafe and had people tell her to go back where she came from when she was from Chinatown. So the fact that we are here now and it's reached another entire level says something very, very disturbing about our country at this moment. But that's what you are here to help us do by bringing your lived experiences and telling stories that many other times other journalists, other great journalists, just don't have the DNA to tell. It doesn't mean they can't tell great stories about other communities, but you've heard stories from your own colleagues, from your own families. You yourselves have been, in some cases, I've seen it, attacked while out doing a live shot. So the stories that you're telling are vitally, vitally, vitally important. And the only way we can really, really drive change is by being truth tellers, because not all of our peers in the industry are telling the truth about this, or they're underplaying the amount of violence against the Asian American community. Thank you for amplifying it. Thank you for highlighting it, because only in that way can we really drive change? And I can end, I'm going I'm to end the way I, I started by saying, Vicki, we cannot thank you enough. You have led the charge. You were one of the very early people. We did a town hall in early, 20, uh, early 2020 when we were really seeing the spike. So we are all so, so indebted to you for leading the charge on this. That's Craig Robinson for you, always turning the spotlight onto someone else. Craig, thank you for providing the leadership, the understanding, and the insight that allows us to be our best and bring our entire selves to work and for being so supportive and being there for us. Okay, everyone, um, I know there's some folks that need to come in, so if anybody else needs to come in, come on in, come on in, find a seat quickly, and we're going to introduce the panel now. First, to my left is Katie Fang. She is the host of the new Katie Fang Show. It launched in April. You can find it on MSNBC as well as Peacock. She is also going to be hosting an upcoming MSNBC special called The Culture is AAPI Women. We'll get to that in a moment and tell you some of the details there. Next to her is Kimmy Yam. She's a reporter for NBC Asian America. If you're ever on our digital platforms and verticals, odds are you have seen Kimmy Yam's byline many times. She's written really thought-provoking articles over the past several years for us and particularly important during the pandemic. Um, next is Jamie Nguyen. She is part of the win-win situation. She and I work very closely together. She is the senior producer of our consumer investigative team. She is also the executive producer of both of our racism virus specials. And then we have Evan Lowe, who is a California Assembly member. He represents the 28th District, the Silicon Valley, where I was before I moved to New York three years ago, a really important part of California. And he's been doing incredible work on behalf of the AAPI community. So please welcome our panelists. Okay, we're going to put up some statistics on the screen here for you to see. To start with kind of where we are right now when it comes to attacks against Asian American Pacific Islander community, that is over the past two years. So March 2020, when the pandemic was really getting going, to March of this year. This is 
over 11,000 incidents reported just by, by people who had something happen to them, whether it was physical, it was verbal, it was a, a bullying incident in school. These are the stats that have been created by the nonprofit uh, Stop AAPI Hate, and it just gives you a sense of what folks are grappling with. One in six of these uh, incidents that was reported were physical attacks, and I want to start with you, Kimmy, because you've been covering this, you know, day in and day out. It's been difficult, I'm sure, personally. But can you talk to us about where things stand now? So give us some of the, you know, the challenges the community has faced, but also what are we learning and how are things different now than they were in March of 2020? Right, Vicki. Um, yeah, this is a great question. I think looking at what we've been through over the past couple years, it's undeniable that all of us feel kind of this baseline sense of anxiety and fear. I'm sure you guys have all kind of felt this on the job as well. Um, and that's the, you can't kind of understate the emotional toll um, that we've kind of all been going through for some time. And uh, I think one really great thing that's come out of this is that the discussion around the attacks and also the solutions have been further complicated as time has gone on. And I think that people have presented kind of a more of a diversity of solutions um, and also recognize that it's not just one thing that has caused you know, the attacks or any of these incidents. Um, as you know, we see that there were over 11,000 incidents over the course of about two years, um, but the vast majority of those incidents, Stop API Hate, uh, says it are not violent and also don't, are not considered crimes. And so therefore, a lot of the solutions around that, um, you know, they say should be focused around education, um, and also uh, far more awareness, civil rights expansions, I mean, I, civil rights protection expansions. Um, I think that, you know, even when we're talking about things like the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, there have been groups as well that have been saying, you know, perhaps this policy is too focused on law enforcement and that there should be other measures um, looked at in the first place like perhaps housing insecurity, food insecurity, mental health. These are all kind of discussions that have increased over time when, you know, at one point the discussion was kind of more focused on, you know, how are we gonna prosecute uh, the attacks that are happening? Um, most of these are, you know, most of what we've been seeing on TV are, you know, violent. Um, so I think that that's been one really huge outcome in this. And then finally, you know, one thing that Dr. Russell Jung of Stop API Hate said is that even though we've seen kind of this heightened um, period of anti-Asian hate, we're also seeing far more mobilization, and that's been pretty steady. You know, even there was a survey that recently came out, the Asian American voter survey uh, from API data, and that showed that two-thirds of you know, API voters have already indicated that they plan on uh, voting in the election. So it's pretty sustained interest, and I think that that's a really positive outcome. I agree. The fact that we are talking about all of these things, the fact that there's this kind of coverage at the national and local levels, it's a, at a momentum, like a tipping point that I have never seen in the last 22 years of my, my own reporting. Evan, I want to bring you in on this because you are part of sort of a small club of Asian American politicians. There just really aren't many of us who are working in public service in the way that you are. What are you hearing from your constituents? And also you shared a personal anecdote about your grandmother and you know how these attacks and what was happening in the community really affected her. Doesn't everyone grow up wanting to be a politician in the Asian American community? Our parents are all saying, be a politician. Yeah, my dad, the optometrist, said, why are you such a failure? Uh, and then, of course, you see the type of action and the engagement that is so important. Uh, but just before we begin, thank you to the organizers for uplifting the voices of AAPI women because it is so critically important that we do so with intentionality. And the reason why I say that particularly is we have zero Democratic women elected in the California state legislature out of 120 zero Democratic women. It is an embarrassment when we take a photo of all of the, all of the men uh, in the legislature. But in talking about this question, there's a call to action here, which is we have to reclaim our righteous place in society. 
and when you're thinking about the Asian hate, what is the collective response? We can do the organizing, which is critically important. You can do the visibility, the education, informing our community. But what is the response? After two years, what change has occurred from policymakers in stopping Asian hate? What is the answer? What is the answer? And if you don't have any answer, that's why it's important that people like us, AAPIs, are in government to be able to say, I do not want to hear any longer my grandmother telling me that she is more afraid of dying from a hate crime than of COVID. And that still stays true to this day. And she lives in San Jose. And I was born and raised in San Jose. Heartbreaking stories. But I, I see a lot of heads nodding because you have similar experiences. So if we want to make the systemic change, then we need to get into the arena and get into the fight and demand action. So what is the collective action? What is happening in many of these states in terms of responsiveness? Now, of course, we're in California, and I serve in the California legislature, but I will tell you what that response is specifically. There was a proposal then for public funds to stopping Asian hate to go into public uh, resources, taxpayer dollars to community-based organizations doing work in the space. Ethnic media grants, community-based organizations on language access, reporting, data requirements. The initial proposal was a, a measly $20 million for our community. But it's because we have the chair of the budget committee, who is AAPI, Phil Ting, who said, this is unacceptable. We will not accept these crumbs. So as a result, California passed $150 million to going towards community-based organizations, ethnic media, to help inform and educate our community. But we can't stop there. And finally, let me just say this. There are real things to acknowledge and address. We need to recognize the own racism in our own communities because the easy response, the gut reaction that we hear is, well, why are these perpetrators coming from a particular community? So let's increase penalties. Well, that's the overly simplistic answer. And we realize that in a democratic society, we need to build coalition. And that's why this work is so important to tell the stories, build empathy, and have individuals in executive positions that understand the stories to amplify our voices as well. And this is a room, obviously, of journalists. We're not politicians. We don't have some of the same platforms that Evan and his colleagues have. But what you do have is the ability to pitch stories. Right? And well, I'm not saying advocacy journalism, but I'm saying pay attention to what's happening in the community and when these bills are passing and when the marches in D.C. are happening. Jamie pitched a story to News Now about the first ever march in D.C. This was about a month ago, and we put it on News Now. It wasn't on a lot of folks' radars. So you guys have to go back to your newsrooms and make sure this is something you're covering because that's how you amplify what's happening and that's what leads to impact and change, right? Katie, let's talk about the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act. Kimmy talked about it, Evan did too. You're our legal expert. Has that done anything? Has that made a difference? Where are we with that? So what I wanted to start with, I don't know, how many of you, when you saw that number on the screen, it was kind of a gut punch, that 11,000, right? And the visualization of that number made it hit home even more astutely and a little bit more acutely. And to answer your question, I just wanted to read a couple of more statistics to you, right? Out of the more than 15,000 agencies that participated in the FBI data collection efforts in 2020, only about 2,400, less than 16%, reported one or more hate crimes. But there was a 224% rise in hate crimes against victims of Asian descent during the period of 2020 to 2021. The reason why I read those numbers to you is because data drives policy. And unfortunately, dealing with the COVID hate crimes, COVID-19 hate crimes act, it really didn't need the beginning part of saying the COVID-19. It really should have just said hate crimes act, right? It didn't have to be specific, although it was necessary because it was to be able to highlight and elevate the fact that this was targeting AAPIs in the community at large. But as a former trial lawyer, prosecutor, and now as a host, we rely upon statistics and evidence. And you as a journalist, you have to rely upon evidence because if not, it's pure opinion. And yes. <laughs> you sneezed, my Jewish husband would say, then I just told the truth. <laughs> but that's what we need. We use statistics and evidence because we have to be driven by facts. And in the absence of this information, you don't get the money you want. You don't get the grants because that's what they rely upon. So my long-winded way of answering your question, unfortunately, because there was such a slow response to getting the legislation there in the first place, because it took 
acts of violence to motivate people in positions of power to be able to get these types of laws and bills in place, we have a way to go. We have a way to go because this COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act is driven by data collection, which sounds just so mundane and it just sounds like it's so ineffective, but at the end of the day, it drives how we get the money to the places to do things like food, food, homes, places where people feel secure so perhaps they get the help that they need to be able to have outlets to be able to control what happens. And so because of that, it is more organic. It's more of this idea that it can't just be us reacting by placing a law into effect to do it. As a prosecutor, of course we have statutes and we have laws in every jurisdiction to deal with crimes of violence against people. But when you don't actually have the accurate and effective reporting to law enforcement of what these numbers are truly driven by, when you don't have prosecutors, when you don't have district attorneys that are elected into office that look like us, that care enough to want to be able to have those crimes be elevated to hate crimes, when they're just enhancements in places like Georgia and they're not actually crimes themselves, that's when it's a problem and that's when it's too slow to take action. So as a lawyer who now has a platform to be able to elevate this information, I rely upon you to be able to do that for me, but I also rely upon myself to make sure that people understand that these are the things that make people's eyes pop. It's the numbers. But to get the numbers, you have to have the accurate reporting, and that's what was the purpose behind it. So in some way, people have to have a little bit of patience, although it's hard, because how do you tell your grandmother? How do I tell my 79-year-old mother? You gotta have a little bit more patience. Oh, money, you gotta wait a little bit, right? You can't do that. So it's tough. It's a really tough spot to be in, I think. A great point you raised, data drives policy, data supports journalism, look for those facts. You've probably heard a lot of the National Gun Violence Archives data lately because we've been doing so much reporting on school shootings. Stop AAPI Hate has done a great job of helping us sort of categorize and provide a data point. So I encourage you to do that and also to look at the FBI hate crimes data because, and also the local police department data in your own small communities because those are the kinds of numbers that you can bring to your editorial meetings and say, hey, we need to report on this. This is what's happening. This is the year-over-year -year increase in attacks on this community or whatever it is that you're focusing on. But the data often is what also helps the pitch get green, green lit. Green lit. Um, and so speaking of that, I want to move on to some of the media coverage and bring in Jamie here. She was the executive producer of both the racism virus specials. And I tell you what, there was a big difference between pitching the first one and the second one. And also, I think it created a foundation and sort of a, a safe place for us to keep revisiting these stories and, and advancing them over the last two years. So Jamie, take us through that because there are a lot of people in this room who want to do what you're doing and want to be successful and bring these stories to air. But give us the secret sauce. You know, I think that this is a big moment for us because if we don't seize it for what it is, all this pain that we're going through is for naught. And so what happened was back in 2021, I'm, I'm in a meeting and you know, as, as the, one of the few Asian Americans in the room, nobody in that room knew what was happening. And I felt this sense of responsibility that like, wait, my family's been dealing with this, my friends and I have been talking about this, but yet nobody in this room knows what's truly happening. So you kind of have to put it in terms that they understand. And I remember the first time I pitched it, it was to a Today Show meeting. And I was very honest. And I said, guys, I have something very personal that I think you guys should be aware of. I said, I live in New York City, on the Upper West Side, one of the most liberal, one of the most highly Asian populated communities, yet I feel uncomfortable walking the streets. I'm very self-conscious. I've never been self-conscious about being Asian American. I said, my mother is afraid to go to the grocery store, and they, they didn't really know why. And I said, because of Wuhan virus. And I think that in that moment, they made a connection. They were like, wow, Jamie's one of us, and she feels this way, and they could relate. And so all of a sudden, we got a story greenlit. And I also have had, had people ask me, well, are you guys just, are, there, are the numbers, are, are people just reporting it more because it's okay to report it? I said, look at the data. You can make up your own mind, but because of organizations like AAPI, Stop AAPI Hate, and as Katie says, facts and numbers matter. You can make up your... It wasn't my opinion. Yes, there were videos that proved it, and video sells and drives stories, 
but get the facts. I wasn't, listen, I said in my head, I never wanted to be like the Asian producer, the Asian journalist. I just wanted to be a journalist. But in this moment, because I was Asian and I sat in that room, I had a responsibility that we all should feel we should bring to the table. I can't not be a woman. I can't not be a mother. I can't not be Vietnamese American. Those are all things that I think enhance storytelling. So you should be empowered to use those tools and add layers to your storytelling and your pitch. You know, Vicky and I, we are part of the consumer investigative unit, right? So we have sources in the consumer beat, or if you're in politics or health, that's your beat. Well, why can't being Asian be part of your beat? Because you're going to be privy to conversations that other people aren't privy to. So use that and harness that and make connections. You know, there's a lot of allies. Like, I look around the room and I see allies everywhere. And in my company, NBC News, we've been empowered to tell these kind of stories because of someone like Cesar Conde, who came in and put in the 50-50 initiative. He said diversity matters, and because it comes from the top, it trickles down. So you gotta start somewhere. And as, as someone growing up, going up in the ranks, you need to look up to people like other EPs in your newsroom, managing editors, make those connections, because from those connections, you get stories greenlit, or stories get approved for shows. So I think you have to start. Don't be afraid. Don't be the Asian. You know, don't be like, keep your head down. You just kind of have to be the squeaky wheel. You just got to break out of that mold. And I think this is our moment to break out of that mold. Kimmy covers the Asian American community full time and she talks about allyship and she talks about some of the things that people are not comfortable talking about in her reporting. And Kimmy, I want to ask you because you've talked a lot about how we can responsibly cover the Asian American community. You can't just parachute in without having some background, some history, doing your homework before you do so that your pitches are successful. But talk to us about the, the responsibility that we have the locally, nationally, print, broadcast, online. And also there's a term that you um, you brought up, uh, ra what was it? Uh, racial literacy. Yes, yeah. racial literacy. I thought this was so fascinating. Help us understand that. Yeah, I, I think one thing that the pandemic definitely did, and as these attacks were happening, was it really exposed how many outlets are so ill-equipped to actually cover these issues in a way that moves the community forward, also doesn't further damage other communities. Um, you know, there's so many of us who have lived experiences that are so valuable to our jobs, and also, you know, I, I think that a lot of that gives us the authority to talk about our own experiences. It gives us the authority to talk about our own mental, uh, mental well-being around around a lot of these issues, emotional health, and also just, you know, how, what we've been through as Asian Americans. But that doesn't always give you the authority to talk about an issue for the community or for different communities. You know, we have very specific, individualized, personal experiences. So while we might understand some of these sensitivities, just by being an Asian American does not qualify you to just cover Asian America, and particularly when we're talking about race. We're talking about marginalized communities that have gotten so little coverage in mainstream outlets. You know, so we're not even just talking about just the, you know, just elevating a lot of these issues to the forefront. We're also helping people unlearn a lot of the crap they've been fed in years past. There's a lot of erroneous stereotypes and really harmful reporting that has been going on around the Asian American community as well as all these other marginalized communities. So, you know, when we're talking about, you know, in terms of or in the context of COVID, I mean, there were a lot, especially in the beginning when people started reporting on this, that I think there were quite a few um, incidents that were immediately reduced to you know, hate crimes or labeled that way when there's a definite sensitivity around it and then later on they maybe didn't turn out to be you know, uh, motivated by racial animus or maybe there were other you know, attacks that the racial aspect wasn't talked about at all. Um, and so these are all important because once you talk about a certain community or you label something as a hate crime, you are attaching a certain 
value to it. And as we know, you know, when we're talking about rhetoric like the Chinese virus, Wuhan virus, we understand how harmful these terms can be. There was one particular day, I believe it was in March 2020, when Representative, uh, the GOP Representative Paul Gozar, and then also Mike Pompeo used this sort of rhetoric. The next day, there was like a 660% increase of these terms on Twitter, right? So you're seeing a lot of this rhetoric being spread around. It is very harmful. When we use the term hate crimes for anything related to Asian Americans, we need to be sure that we know that there is, first of all, that, that it has been confirmed to be investigated as such, and also that perhaps there are other uh, factors at play that need to, be, need to complicate the narrative, because what we're doing is you're really looking at communities that if you do use erroneous terms, you do attach stereotypes to them, you're further pushing those back. Everything we talk about has a response and has incredible weight because we are the media. But you know, so with that comes the responsibility of accuracy and precision and nuance. Thank you, Kimmy. Evan, let me talk to you about this. Um, you know, you have relationships with journalists who cover the issues, and they're not all Asian American issues that you know your constituents care about. There are many other things, the economy being one of them. What advice do you have for journalists to develop those sources with the lawmakers in their area so they can get those stories, be ahead of the curve uh, on this kind of reporting? Um, well, I think uh, having the personal relationship, the cell phone numbers are always very important. Oftentimes, the staff will be very incredulous to be defensive and to try to say, what's the angle for the story? But of course, this is about a personal experience, which is critically important as well, too. And part of the conversation is also, I'm sure we've all seen the graphic in which the, the news talks about the different community groups, about the blacks, the Latinos, women, LGBT, and there's zero AAPI. Uh, because we are st statistically insignificant. How many of you like to be deemed and qualified as insignificant? No one does. So I think there's also the accountability factor and the important power that you have is to create a sense of urgency in building public support. Because similarly, Vicky, as a response, we read the news and we watch the TV just as much as everyone else does. And as a result of the stories and responses, we will oftentimes introduce legislation. In fact, you and I have partnered on a piece of legislation in terms of uh, consumer affairs to help amplify a message in creating a sense of urgency on these issues. And that is storytelling. Uh, so know that we are responsive, government is responsive, and the politicians are responsive because it's newsworthy. And it also helps to amplify and build public support on whatever case that we might be building. Yeah, really important to know what kinds of pieces of legislation your local lawmakers are working on, and if you can cover those the way I did with um, legislation that Evan did in California that required you know, a certain level of dental care for consumers that they'd have to get x-rays before they would go and do some of these like teeth aligner things. It wasn't so much a partnership, but we covered it. We covered it because it mattered to an investigation that we did. And so that's something you can look for and a great original pitch you can bring into your newsrooms. Um, Katie, can you tell us a little bit about this new series, The Culture Is, that's going to be on MSNBC and this one that you're working on that's it's focusing specifically on AAPI women? Yeah, what an amazing opportunity to be able to take a platform like MSNBC, MSNBC on Peacock, and be able to have this opportunity through people that have the vision, like Omnika Thompson and Rashida Jones and Yvette Miley, to be able to take these ideas and present it in a way where it's okay to focus on AAPI women. That it's not some type of uh, outlier that it's happening, that we have this chance to have a, a table where we're going to sit down with women, AAPI women in all different walks of life, all different backgrounds, to talk about our similarities, our common denominators, but also talk about the things that make us uniquely different in and of ourselves. And to have the chance to have these dialogues is what I'm looking forward to the most. But the idea of being able to say, I went through that, there's this word that is always used, I think, in our space, in this industry space, which is relatability. And of course, we all have this shared relatability of who we are and our backgrounds, 
but to be able to have that sense of community, that shared experience. That's exactly what we look for when there is good quality nuanced reporting, when the journalism is exactly where it needs to be, where the shows hit just the right spots. It's because somebody who's out there is listening and they feel that relatability with what you've gone through, that our families have gone through the same things. That being said though, I'm from Miami, Florida. I speak fluent Spanish and very little Korean. I know enough to order banchan and that's about it and frankly it comes anyway. So you don't have to order it. But I am totally different than perhaps somebody who's a Korean American that's in California. But it doesn't mean that I didn't have the same pressures, the same expectations, and even now the same fears as somebody who's on the East Coast as the West Coast in Seattle, right? And so it's going to be this, an incredible chance to sit down and say, you look like you've made it. You look like you're in the top of your game. You look like me in this different space, and yet, dot, dot, dot. What was it for you? Was there something for you? Was there someone for you? And hopefully that gives people the opportunity to say, oh my God, I had that too. Or oh my gosh, I want that too. And it gives a pathway, it gives people some inspiration. And again, the relatability, it's like, oh my gosh, you know what, that person is just like me. And that's exactly what is gonna be amazing to do the culture is AAPI women. Can't wait to see that. And I will say, you know, something that I noticed in covering this over the last few years, that's very different than when I was your age, becoming a journalist, is I felt more permission to bring my entire self to work. And I think that's something that you all, you may take that for granted actually, because I think that there are, there are a lot of younger journalists who would, of course I would bring myself to work, my identity, you know, and my background, but that wasn't always the case. It used to be you just wanted to come to work and be seen as a journalist, and if you were worried actually to pitch stories that maybe would pigeonhole you into being, oh, the Asian American reporter with the Asian American issues again. But I think there is a power, as Jamie was saying, and there is a moment here that we can all learn from and capitalize on and build on. And Jamie, you pitched the racism virus. It's one thing to pitch the, the story that the Today Show first covered, and then we covered incidents on nightly news as well, but you turned it into a one hour long special. It actually started as half an hour and then turned into this behemoth, which now has over a million views on YouTube. So how did you talk about the relationships you built? You didn't show up one day and say, I want an hour show. Talk about the relationships you built and how that came to fruition and how hard you had to push for it actually. You know, I think one of the things when you pitch stories, you've got to be real. You don't oversell, right? So I, when I pitch a story, I probably undersell and then over deliver because you don't want to promise an exclusive that isn't an exclusive. So because we had this body of work, people knew that, that this was a real thing and it deserved treatment. So the first time we did the special, the, our first special was in 2021 and it was a chance encounter. I happened to run into to, um, Ali, Ali Mark, uh, not Ali Markowitz, um, I ran into Ali Zelenko, and I, she's like, what are you working on? And I told her, you know, I, I really kind of want to pitch this special on all this hate that's happening with Asian Americans. She said, girl, do it. She was like my biggest cheerleader. She said, why not? So I literally, because she empowered me and gave me courage, I like sent an email to Janelle Rodriguez, who oversees news now. I said, listen, this is what's happening. We should do it. And shortly thereafter, she said, let's do it. Right? So the first time it was easy. It was a new topic. It hadn't been discussed. But here we are, 2022, and it's a much harder topic because it's been out in the media for a while now, and there's inflation issues, there's the war in Ukraine, so there's a lot of competing interests. So when I started talking to Jill back in February, she said, you know, there's a lot going on. I don't think we have, we have the bandwidth right now. But I kept coming back to her. And finally she said, why don't you give me a full-fledged what would it look like? How is it going to be different? Drill it down for me. So I gave her a rundown, a fake rundown of what I foresaw as the, as, as the special. And she said, because it was so well laid out, do it. And she, at first she thought about doing it for 30 minutes. And I said, I don't think we should do it in 30 minutes. 30 minutes is just going to be sizzle and sparkle. For a real substance, you know, for a real conversation, with substance, it needs to be an hour. And for a community that feels like it's underserved, we might as well, if we're gonna go in, go all in. And so she gave me that, she gave me that leash to kind of hang myself with if it didn't come through. <laughs> you know, you kind of have to bet on yourself sometimes. And I did, and I cashed in all my chips. 
you know, when you have a passion project, you just go all in. I probably didn't sleep. I still had to keep my day job, right? We still had to do our consumer stories for the Today Show and Nightly News. And I worked on this on the side. And if you have a passion project, you know, there are some people here who volunteered, like Erin Kim, raise your hand. I saw you in here. So she's a producer for the third Michelle hour. Michelle Cho, too. Yeah. She was a pr producer for the third hour. And after the first racism virus, there was so much love in our building. I got so many emails from people I knew, people I didn't know. And Erin was one of the first people who raised her hand and said, if there is another one, please let me help. And so I remembered that, and when it came up again, I cleared it with her manager, Cecilia Fang, who's in the building. Say hi, She's the, uh, she runs the third hour of the Today Show. But I went to Cecilia and I said, hey, is it okay if Erin does this? And she said yes. And so it's about partnerships, relationships, and understanding, right? And it was also her passion project for Erin, because she had to fulfill her responsibilities to the show, right? But she still wanted to do it. So sometimes you kind of have to, to go into overdrive to make these things happen. And once you prove yourself, it'll be a lot easier and you'll get more resources along the way. Did you hear that though? She worked in the margins. She worked on top of what she did. You still have to deliver the bread and butter of your daily job. But when you can do this and you have a proven track record, it makes that next project, that next pitch, just that much easier. And I love that bet on yourself. Okay, we've been talking a lot about this community, the state of Asian America. And the, the small but mighty role that Asian Americans are starting to play in politics. So we had our very own Steve Kornacki with the khakis at the big board to break it down for us ahead of the uh, midterm. So let's take a look at that. All right, a big hello from the big board to the AAJA convention. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person, but... I'm not sure they're going to let me leave this thing between now and November, so I, I better get used to it, better get comfortable here. But did want to share with you some of the data points we're looking at when it comes to the AAPI vote potentially affecting the 2022 midterm elections here. So some numbers here maybe to, to put it in context here. We'll start with the big picture here. We'll use the 2020 election as a baseline. Obviously, Joe Biden defeating Donald Trump. Nationally, if you looked at the popular vote in 2020, Biden beating Trump by about four and a half points. That's the margin there in the national popular vote. Biden plus four and a half. But that plus four and a half point margin for Biden was not equally distributed across every group. There were some big disparities when you looked at racial and ethnic groups and how they voted in 2020. So let's take a look at that here. Among white voters, if you take a look at all of the post-election surveys, average them together, Trump actually beat Biden by about 12 points among white voters. You see white voters still a little bit more than two-thirds of the entire electorate. That number's been ticking down election after election, but it's still the overwhelming majority. Among African-American voters, totally different story. Biden beat Trump by nearly 80 points. Among Hispanic voters, Biden's margin was about 27. That was down a little bit from Hillary Clinton's margin over Trump in 2016. And then among Asian American voters here, you see 4% of the electorate in 2020. Big win for Biden, 67 to 30%. But the big story with the Asian American population in terms of voting is it's getting larger and larger and large enough to measure. So I want to show you this. This is the growth we've seen just in the 21st century here of the AAPI vote in presidential elections. And you can see back in 2000, it was under 2%. It's ticked up here about half a point or so every election, close to a point between 2016 and 2020. So now four and a half percent in the most recent presidential election. It's a number that continues to rise. So it's a demographic as that number rises, obviously, that becomes more and more significant uh, in national uh, elections, national elections. And then the question is the 2022 midterm. So a couple of ways to look at this. First of all, let's look at the places that have the highest AAPI populations. And here we're talking states where it's you know, going to be double digits. Uh, really, there's three states here. California, Hawaii, New Jersey. Now, neither, none of these states look like they have major statewide races in 2022 that are going to be major competitive races. So if you want to look for the impact of the AAPI vote potentially in 2022, it may not be so much when it comes to Senate races 
and governor's races, but there are a number of congressional districts, and here they are. These are the congressional districts all around the country that have the largest AAPI populations. You can see if you see blue, they're controlled by Democrats. Now, you actually do see a couple here that are red. These are districts with the largest AAPI populations. As I say, generally, it's 20% or more of the population, the districts you're seeing here. Some of these much more than 20%, but a couple of these districts are going to be absolutely key to who controls the House this November. I circle a couple of them here. In California, these three districts in particular, the 40th, the 45th, the 47th, and here you're talking about Southern California, Orange County. Interestingly, the 40th and the 45th district, these are two districts, you see they're red, they're Republican controlled. Michelle Steele is a Republican freshman congresswoman, Asian American congresswoman. She's running for re-election in the 45th. Young Kim, Republican freshman, Asian American member of Congress. She's running for election, re-election in the 40th district. This was one of the surprises of the 2020 election was in these districts, in this part of California, there did seem to be, not in the presidential election, but in the congressional election, there seemed to be a bit, of sh a bit of a shift of the AAPI vote away from the Democrats toward the Republicans, help Young Kim, help Michelle Steele get, re -elect uh, get elected. Can they get reelected in 2022? That's going to be a big story we're watching on election night. And again, these districts with very large uh, AAPI populations. Also, California's 47th district, you see it's blue on here. It is potentially competitive. It has a large uh, Asian American population. Katie Porter, Democrat, trying to defend that seat. Uh, it's politically competitive. Katie Porter's got a pretty big national profile. So that's one where the AAPI vote could be big this November. Of course, as I said, we have that interesting story, particularly in Orange County, California, where at the House level, Republicans are seeing an opportunity with this demographic that maybe they didn't think they had just a couple years ago. So those races in particular will be paying close attention to. But anyway, like I said, they're pretty much going to have me glued to this board between now and November. Uh, but this is one of the storylines we're certainly going to be paying close attention to. And again, hope you're having a great convention. Thank you to see for that. Great report. Do you, do you live in one of those districts? You have some story ideas just from that short video there with Steve. Okay, so we are definitely going to open this up to questions from all y'all. Um, and while you're gathering yourselves, we're going to have some microphones being passed around. Just raise your hands. I'm just going to do one quick piece of advice, last piece of advice, thoughts. Whether it's self-care, one thing you'd like to see covered, how you get through all of this, just right through our panel. Um, go ahead, Katie. Be your authentic self, whatever that is. There's a place for you, and you will find your place. But don't hesitate to always be exactly who you are. Don't try to fit a mold, don't try to fit a stereotype, because at the end of the day, it's going to be successful for you. Kimmy? Yeah, um, Vicki, earlier you mentioned that in years past, you may not have felt so comfortable bringing your whole self, and obviously we're talking about being our authentic selves. Um, I really, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to bring a lot of that to work and constantly bring ideas that do not, you know, that always weren't a discussion or they don't get shot down. But I know a lot of people in other newsrooms don't necessarily feel that way. And a lot of when, a lot of being an Asian American reporter means that when you do pitch Asian American stories, it's seen as activism. And I think that in a lot of our newsrooms, the center remains very white. When objectivity doesn't mean that you're just covering a lot of issues that impact a white population or a white mainstream population or whatever that means, it means that Asian Americans are part of our country, are, a, of, are of critical importance to this country and should remain a regular part of our media diet. And so demanding these stories be elevated pitching these stories and covering these stories should be a regular thing. You should never be made to feel like you're doing some kind of activism or advocating for just yourself. They deserve to be elevated and we all deserve to read them. Thank you, Kimmy. Jamie? I was just about to say amplify. We all need each other. This is a time for solidarity. It's not just about the AAPI community, but it's also about our other brothers and sisters in the black community, in the Hispanic community. You know, we need each other. And if we coalesce as a our, our storytelling is only going to get better. Um, and I do want to give a shout out. I see Sepon Kim in here, and he's been crushing it in New York. 
on covering AAPI. So we need to celebrate. Like I said before, this is the moment, right? So if we can't turn this ugliness into something meaningful and tell these stories and get heard, then it's all for naught. So don't be afraid. Just use this moment. Support each other. Thank you, Janie. Evan? Uh, thank you. I was uh, mentioning this to you um, that uh, recently I went to the memorial for Norman Mineta uh, in San Jose, who was a, uh, one of the highest ranking Asian Pacific Islanders in the cabinet uh, level for the United States. And I was next to Mike Honda, who was a congressman also from that area. And I asked Mike, I call him Uncle Mike, I said, what do we do? I was trying to reflect on everything. I said, what do we do? How do we respond? What's your answer? And he said, the answer lies with you and everyone in this generation, that there is no other cavalry. So let us not wait for someone else to fix the problem. Let's get in the arena and realize our obligation to society and again, reclaim our righteous place in our democracy. Thank you so much to our panelists. Let's get those hands up for the questions. Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been really terrific. And by the way, please say your name and where you're from. My name is John Funabiki. I'm from the Bay Area. Um, just want to, this has been very inspiring. I want to thank all of the speakers. I want to thank Evan for the work he's been doing in Silicon Valley. He recently hosted a, a luncheon for AJA or so. You had to look him up. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the potential uh, or, or what you're doing or what the potential could be for AJA journalists to um, collaborate, partner, conspire with black journalists, Hispanic journalists, Native American journalists, gay and lesbian journalists, et cetera, et cetera, because hate you know, knows no boundaries. And I think this is a great opportunity for AJA journalists to kind of take a lead in developing a more multicultural, multiracial um, initiative. I know Naomi, who's the executive director of AAJ, is in this room, but one thing I will say is we used to have a conference called Unity, where all four of us would all get together, or our organizations. I don't know the logistics or why, why it ended, but I will say, you can do that yourself by looking up the members of these other groups, finding journalists that you admire, whose work that you, you enjoy reading, and making sure you retweet and share and amplify. You all have the power of your own social media and the platforms that you have, so when you make those connections on an individual basis, it goes a long way. That's, that's what I would say there. Um, I think we had a question back there as well. Hello. Hi, my name is Meniza. Um, I'm from LA. Um, one of my questions, I think everyone kind of touched on data and really like having shitty data not only like destroys the storytelling but really impacts policy. So for example, like we have Stop AAPI Hate as an organization who's collecting that data where people are feeling more comfortable to report the hate, but they're not gonna report it necessarily to law enforcement uh, because there's a discomfort. Even the FBI kind of, and even California DOJ like kind of defines hate very differently. I mean, that just comes down to even mass shootings, um, things like that. Um, so my question is, looking not just from a reporting standpoint, but and from a policy standpoint, how do we make those de definitions uniform, right? Like if you're reporting API 8, do you take the organization's numbers and the FBI numbers, show them, and just be very upfront, right? Like there's a disparity because of these reasons, but then how does that policy impact come in? Like if you're not going from um, the, California DOJ's or the FBI's definition. So how do we move forward making sure those data points are more uniform and how do we make it like more pronounced in our reporting? I can, I'm happy to take this one. Um, I think that when we do get data, from a journalist standpoint, if you're just reporting the numbers, it's actually fairly useless. Like people don't, there needs to be a greater story behind it, right? And there's also a lot of nuance behind the numbers. I think the numbers can only show one side of the story. So when we're looking at what tangible, you know, possible solutions there are, when we're looking at this larger issue, you have to be going to people on the ground as well as experts like social scientists and people like that to really flesh out what you're trying to look for. Um, I do think that in 
you know, in talking about hate crimes, one of the uh, issues that I saw early on was that we'd look at data and then um, a lot of people would turn to like a celebrity <laughs> to talk about it. Uh, when really we need to be talking to experts who've been familiar with both policy from like the legal standpoint and also activists on the ground who have specific demands that they see within the communities that they work with, you know, for historically. And so you need to kind of be reaching out to as many people as possible in these separate, you know, areas of expertise to get an accurate picture of, you know, what we're really looking at and how we should present it. Um, I, I do think that there's a tendency to reduce a lot of that. And I, I think that, you know, it, whatever it is, we should be very upfront with the numbers. I know that for us ourselves, we've reported all of that, but it doesn't come without that context. So context is everything, especially when we're talking about crime and, and, and attacks. Evan, did you want to touch on that? I just I want to, uh, just two, two things, uh, observations. One, is, of course, is the distinction of a hate crime and that of a hate incident. And how do we have the laws accordingly to respond towards that? And that's where the coalition is so important of the uncanny allyship, for example, the AAPI community and the Jewish community and the attacks on synagogues. And so, at least in the legislative front, we do do a lot of the partnership that exists. But I just want to, sit to reemphasize this point, which is, the policy can be sound. You can have the greatest policy based on science, data, whatever numbers. But we have to factor in that of the political environment. And you, you all know this. The statistics can only speak so much. But where you come into play is the creating the sense of urgency. Why is this politically expedient? Why should a policymaker go into the front lines to make a systemic change based on what? It cannot just simply be based on policy. It cannot. It must be based on a wide variety of other different factors. And I think that is the nuance that is also critically important to best understand and asking that question. If this policy is so sound, well, why is it that we are the only industrialized country that cannot solve this firearm problem? We know the data, but why? So that is the human element that must be told as well. Great point. Uh, any other, oh, I see a hand back here and a hand over here. Oh, and a hand right here. So let's go one, two, three. Uh, my name is Lloyd LaQuesta, and Evan, good to see you, and, and Vicky, good to see Lloyd, you also. Lloyd, good to see you. Um, I, and I apologize because I walked in a little late if this has already been discussed, but throughout the history of AHA and even Unity, there's always been a discussion about are we journalists first or are we Asians? And Norman Mineto, who was a good friend, actually spoke at our convention once and said that we as Asian Americans owe it to the Asian community to tell the stories and to speak out for them. Now, a lot of us as journalists are saying, well, wait a minute, I, I, I'm an Asian, but I'm a journalist also, and I'm not representing any type of group. Now, we've seen how this has played out over the last year with the Asian hate uh, issues and how some Asian American reporters have become very emotional on the air and such. Do you as journalists feel that is good to do that and is it, as an Asian American journalist, our duty to be telling the stories of the community but, be going, but going beyond just telling the stories but saying how things affect me personally as a journalist of color? Such a great question from such a great journalist, guys. Lloyd LaQuest is a legend from the Bay Area. So glad. I'm OG. I'd like Katie to tackle this one first, if you don't mind, Katie, only because Katie is in the perspective and the opinion space where she has free reign to be emotional, to point things out, to have an opinion. And then I think we can chat about it as, as journalists who are Asian American as well. It's an incredibly thoughtful question because it's this idea of bringing your whole self to your work and how do you necessarily shelve that component of who you are. I'll just give you just anecdotally, um, it's not about the Asian American community, but the Uvalde school shooting that happened. Um, I have a seven-year-old daughter who's in first grade and when the news came out, it affected me and it still continues to affect me. And one of my uh, most, I'll use the adjective successful, not to be insensitive, but one of my most successful episodes that I've done for my show, and especially on social media, was when I 
introduced and talked about the victims of the Uvalde school shooting. And all I did was I mentioned their names, their ages, and a little bit about who they were because I wanted the memory of them to live on in perpetuity. I wanted it to be living in a space for a very long time. I cried. And one of the things that was told to me from total strangers, of course, on social media and otherwise, and other platforms was, thank you for the humanity. Thank you for showing that it affected you. Thank you that it showed that you cared enough about who these people were, even though you never met them, these little kids and these teachers in the community in Uvalde. Thank you for that. It was hard because I felt like there was an obligation of me to, remain some, to maintain some stoicism in doing it, but it was an inescapable part of who I am. But because I'm in, in perspectives, because I do have an opinion show, I do have that luxury. But I don't think that you necessarily can divorce yourself from that. And I think that if that is a, something that is occurring to you, and I could be wrong, I did not grow up in the journalism space, so I apologize if I'm giving poopy advice right now, but it's how you are. And I think that, again, this idea of you not being authentic about what is happening um, I think it does a disservice to the viewers, to the people who are listening, to tuning in, and that's the reason why I just am who I am, but again, it's a luxury that I have on the platform that I have. We are humans first, right? We are humans, and we all share humanity. We may be different sexual orientation, we may be a parent or not a parent, we may be whatever color that we are outwardly, but we are a, an amalgamation of everything that makes us who we are. So that should come through in your pitches. That should come through in how you cover a story. But you can't let yourself get in the way of that story. And I think that's the approach I take, which is, yes, I feel extremely emotional covering school shootings, covering attacks on the Asian American community. I do my best to keep the emotions in check because I need to earn the viewer's trust and bring them the information that they need to hopefully go back to their communities, talk to their friends who are Asian American or mothers of students or fathers of students. Whatever it is that you're covering, you're trying to arm people with information that's gonna make their life better. And whatever you can bring from your life to help with that, in addition to the facts and staying accurate to the tenets of your job as a journalist, you can't lose that way. You can always go to bed and sleep at night with your head on your pillow knowing that you did the right thing in that way. So I think you're right, Lloyd. There is a lot of like, I'm a journalist, I'm a journalist, I've gotta be, but we all realize like we have opinions. We do, we are humans. We have opinions about school shootings. We have opinions about guns, about Roe v. Wade. That's all true, but your opinion isn't what you bring to your job. Your job is to bring the facts and the information to the people and you should correct for that bias. You should acknowledge that bias so you can do a better job of making sure you bring balance to the reporting. That's, that's how I cope with it and that's, that's the advice I have for younger journalists. Um, I know there's so many questions. Please, is that you, Michelle? Go ahead. Uh, my name is Christine Lee. I'm the assistant dean at UCLA, but today I'm speaking and asking the question as someone who was in politics some 30 years ago, so it's nice to see somebody like Evan, the newer generation, getting involved. I have a question because when we started working on Asian Pacific Islander issues some 30 years ago, uh, I was working on Mike Wu, who ran for mayor in Los Angeles, and then Hel Gray Davis, who ran for uh, uh, first for lieutenant governor and two-term governor. When I was serving as his senior advisor, we were very careful to use the, the, the phrase APIA because people who are of Pacific Islander heritage, they're Americans too. So I don't know since when we did this pivot to AAPIs, and I really would like to have you address this issue as journalists and politicians, because I think language matters. I was trained as a journalist. I think if we're gonna be inclusive, if we're gonna address people, whether they're Americans or not, we either call them Asian Pacific Islander heritage, uh, uh, people with, with Asian Pacific Islander heritage, or we call them Asian Pacific Islander Americans. So we're all inclusive and we're not biased ourselves. Thank you. Language absolutely matters. I, I don't know when the shift was made. Do any of you? I mean, I would say, you know, we obviously, when we're writing, we go by AP style, but in terms of being inclusive, we do need to be as inclusive as possible. And this is why we expand the types of coverage we have to include all these groups. It's why we do need to consistently update language. I think that 
language is an ever-evolving thing. And when people get more information about what makes people you know, included in the news cycle, we, we should be updating it so that more people feel heard. Um, but I also do think that in Asian America, there's also a tendency to paint everyone over with a broad brush and say everyone has this specific experience. And so when we're reporting on specific groups, I think it is very important to make sure your language is precise in that, okay, it, does this impact Pacific Islanders? Does this impact you know, East Asians? Does this impact South Asians? Who are we writing about? Precision is key and inclusivity is also key. So I think it really depends on the circumstance, but of course, language as it evolves, journalism should too. Uh, we, Katie Fang has to go tape a show. We are working journalists. So I just want to thank everyone so much, especially a a uh, AAJA for helping us put this amazing panel on. Of course, NBCU Academy, as this year, Yvette Miley. And I also want to draw your attention to the card that you were given when you came in with the schedule for NBCU Academy. So at tomorrow, Friday, the two breakout sessions, breakout one and two that, are, that start at noon, they have little stars by them that say they're invite only. They're not, they're open to everyone. So please, if you are interested in going, if you have friends that are interested in going, come on by. We're gonna be doing the breakout number one and number two, the future of streaming and digital. That'll be an awesome panel, as well as how to report on mass shootings. You are all welcome to join. And could we get another round of applause for these incredible panelists?